So, Jamie, Ian's left. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. I'm still searching for another podcast host. We've had I've had a few duels on top of the um, top of the Brainwaves HQ, and no one's passed muster as yet. I wondered what those noises were. Yeah. Oh, so is yeah. it past muster or past mustard? Because I've never known both. Okay. Okay. Never sure. But in the meantime, I thought I'd invite some friends around to help us redecorate, and I got Ben over from the Unlucky Frog. Yeah. And he's got some kind of new art project, but which I assumed was to do with decorating. Is that right, Ben? You you paint things, what, right? What, what, what do you mean redecorating? Like painting walls and stuff, right? Yeah, you know, wallpaper. You want me to paint these walls with a broken toad size too? Do you know how long that's going to take? Ian, Ian, did you know? Did you did you did you ask Ben beforehand what kind of painting he does? No, I just made an assumption. Ben, can you please tell Ian what kind of painting that you do? I paint, uh, well, I paint models mainly like oh. point eight mil scale. So, which is a little bit smaller than the. See so what you're saying is this sort of square meter wall is going to take some time. I mean, I I'll do it, but it would probably cost you a lot more than if you hired a guy that had decorators brushes. Okay, okay, I th- I, I I'm going to need to have a think about this. In the meantime. Join us in the studio. We'll have a wee chat, and uh, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll have a think about this. Jamie, do the headlines while I have a think about what the th- terrible things I've done. That was Ian McAllister, and I'm Jamie Adams, and this is Brainwaves episode 72, bringing you the best in board game and tabletop gaming news. These are the headlines for the week of the 3rd of May, 2021. We say goodbye to a legend. Wizards conjures up a unique proposition. And Christian T. Peterson comes home to roost. All this and more on this episode of Brainwaves. And we're kicking off this week with some sad news. I'm sad to announce the passing of celebrated artist Robin Wood, who has died at the age of 67. Now, Robin was known for her work with portraitures of characters in the Dragon Riders of Pern series by Anne McCaffrey. And indeed, her first professional commission was character cards for the Dragon Riders of Pern board game from Mayfair Games in 1983. See, it all connects, it all connects. But also... Her contribution to the tabletop gaming art world is several celebrated covers of TSR-era Dungeons & Dragons books. Now, TSR was the company that originally owned the Dungeons & Dragons rights until they were consumed by Wizards of the Coast. Now, these include Time of the Dragon, Van Richten's Guide to Ghosts, and Treasures of Greyhawk from the Dragonlance, Ravenloft, and Greyhawk settings, respectively. She was diagnosed with cancer in 2019 and sadly passed away on April the 19th. The thoughts from everyone at the Giant Brain and Brainwaves are with her family. Some fantastic art. I urge everyone to have a look. And she had a fa- she did a fantastic tarot deck as well. All these little bits and pieces of art. I say it's not little. It's some great pieces of art. But contribute to the overall flavour of Dungeons and Dragons that's permeated over, over 40 years. Yeah, I don't know her work terribly well myself. But yeah, I, I, I know some of those names in there. And I'm sure her legacy will live on. I, I I must admit that I I wasn't familiar with the name uh, when her passing was announced, but I mean Dragon Riders of Pern looms pretty large in the fantasy subculture, and and obviously a big deal in the 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 early days of D and D. So yeah, very very sad. Uh, we must move on, of course, and on to Ian. I believe we, of course, as we do almost every podcast now, have news from Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro. Indeed, I'm borrowing your financial... Is it your financial Homburg or pants? I've, I've forgotten now. I can't remember. My metaphors are too mixed up right now. Well, let's go for financial pants. I'm borrowing Jamie's financial pants for this episode. So back in February, Hasbro announced that going forward, they'd be reporting the financials of Wizards of the Coast and digital gaming as their own segment for their financial reports. And the reports for the first quarter of 2021 are in, and it's quite illuminating. In the first quarter of this year, 75% of Hasbro's operating profit came from Wizards of the Coast and digital gaming. That digital gaming is presumably mostly Magic Gathering Arena. Uh, This is up from the whole of 2020, where that particular segment of the company could only manage a paltry 72% of operating profits. Put your finger out, guys. Come on. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. So a huge part of... Hasbro's gaming profits are from Wizards of the Coast and Magic Gathering in a, a surprise to probably absolutely no one really, and Dungeons and Dragons as well, presumably contributing to that. 
During that conference call of Hasbro board members for this financial quarter, CEO Brian Golner announced to board members that Hasbro are looking to meld their brands with NFT technology. I'm going to now try and explain what that is. Sit back, everyone. This is, this is going to be good. This is going to be good. Yeah, yeah. Strap in, everyone. <laughs> NFT stands for non-fungible tokens, which isn't really any clearer, I'll admit. The important thing to really know is that each one of these tokens is a digital asset that is utterly unique, like having a a completely unique trading card. These are being used right now to sell art online, which is where you might have heard about them a, a lot recently, selling digital art online in a way where you can actually trace how unique that individual piece of art you have bought is. Ben, you just said beforehand you had a really good explanation for NFTs. Yeah, so a lot of people are struggling to to wrap their head around and understand NFTs. So the way the way that I said it is, see the the first picture that you built in your head of what an NFT is. Back to that, it really is as lame as that. <laughs> it's as lame as you first thought it is an <laughs> NFT. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and get to a little bit more of an explanation uh, that I've borrowed from a Reddit user in a moment. Uh, but I would like to um, quote from what CEO Brian Goldner said. He said, NFTs are a real opportunity for us. As you know, we have so many brands that really operate on multiple demographic levels, whether it's Transformers, whether it's Magic and the Dungeons and Dragons brand, and brands like G.I. Joe. We have a team that is leading our effort out of the West Coast. We have our arms around this and see multiple opportunities on the NFT side. And you'll hear more about that as we move forward. But we are actively developing our opportunities here and we do see it as substantial. Now that is obviously a lot of corporate speak that means basically nothing. But effectively, it sounds like Hasbro are looking to leverage the unique properties of NFTs in order to sell products to customers. Considering how well Arena has done for Magic Gathering during lockdown, This does seem like kind of a logical avenue for Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro, if one fraught with a bit of uncertainty. We've come across a breakdown of what NFTs are from a Mm -hmm. user on Reddit called Queer Samus, and I'd like to read that to you now because it does kind of sum up the sort of ridiculous nature of how NFTs are currently being used. The underlying technology is kind of interesting, but the way they're currently being implemented is absolutely nuts you say interesting so, just, and also as a nod to our duly departed no he's not dead he's just left the podcast mr ian chandler isn't he horrendously unenvironmentally sustainable oh yeah i mean there's a lot of there's a lot of blockchain and bitcoin stuff in the background of nfts which have their own horrible environmental impact but brushing over that briefly for now so here's the quote from queer samus on reddit imagine if you went up to the mona lisa and you were like i'd like to own this and someone nearby went Give me $65 million and I'll burn down an unspecified amount of the Amazon rainforest in order to give you this receipt of the purchase. So you paid them and they went, here's your receipt. Thank you for your purchase. And went to an unmarked supply closet in the back of the museum and posted a handmade label inside it behind the brooms that said, Mona Lisa, currently owned by whoever you are. So if anyone wants to know who owns it, they'd have to find the specific closet in the specific hallway and look behind the correct brooms. And you went... Can I take the Mona Lisa home now? And they went, oh, God, no. Are you stupid? You only bought the receipt that says you own it. You didn't actually buy the Mona Lisa itself. You can't take the real Mona Lisa, you idiot. You can take this, though. I gave you the replica print in a cardboard tube that's sold in the gift shop. Also, the person selling you the receipt of purchase has at no point in time ever owned the Mona Lisa. This quote ends with, unfortunately, if this doesn't really make sense or seem like any logical person would be happy about this exchange, then you've understood it perfectly. NFTs are just a really weird thing. They, like I say, the underlying tech is kind of vaguely interesting, but the way they're being used right now is absolutely goddamn mad and effectively is a pyramid scheme. I'll add some links in the show notes to some explanations by The Verge, which is a, tech, a technology site as to what NFTs are, and a couple of other links to try and explain what NFTs are. But also add on to that, you know, burn down an unspecified amount of the Amazon rainforest in order to give you it. That's not happening in a single instance. That is happening all day, every day to keep these yeah. things, uh, these these things going. If you've tried to build a PC computer in the last year or so, you might have noticed that the price of graphic cards has gone through the roof, and that is mostly due to 
Bitcoin mining. And NFTs are kind of closely linked to that kind of activity, unfortunately. Anyway, Jamie, let's move away from absolutely nonsensical stuff to slightly more real world things that are rather easier to understand. I don't know. We are talking about board games here. Well, fair. Uh, (laughs) Now, we've covered a number of times how Fantasy Flight Games has been undergoing, let's say, divisions in its operational structure. This is more of that, but it focuses on the Fantasy Flight Games Center, which is an event, food, and retail site in Roseville, Minnesota. Now, I didn't realize they had a like a actual site that was also a shop. That's oh yeah, big one. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. huge. The site has now been acquired from Asbidame North America, owners of Fantasy Flight since 2014, by Gamesetter Inc., which is a games company owned by Christian T. Peterson. Now that name might sound familiar. He's a games designer of such games uh, like A Game of Thrones, Star Wars Armada, and a Wii game called Twilight Imperium. Yeah, all the additions. He's also the former CEO of Asmodee North America and the original founder of Fantasy Flight Publishing, which then became Fantasy Flight Games. He left Asmodee in 2018 after their acquisition. Now, Peterson said in a statement, Despite the devastation that COVID-19 has wracked upon our world and on many tabletop game retailers, I strongly believe that our tabletop gaming community is eager to again share great gaming experiences face-to-face. We hope to make this destination an even more amazing place in the future. Cool. Okay. Uh, Let's see the games. Let's see what you're going to do. I think this is like kind of fascinating because Fantasy Flight put that center together. There's been big, obviously, Netrunner World events, X-Wing World events have all been held in that center over the last however many years that those games have been around. And with Fantasy Flight, downsizing is the wrong word, but becoming more focused on particular products, like the, the RPG wing has been hoved off into Edge Publishing, the X-Wing Miniatures games and the Star Wars Miniatures games have been hoved off into... Atomic Mass. Atomic Mass games. Yeah, I mean, I'm really interested to see what Peterson is doing with that space, because has he got a deal with Fantasy Flight where they're going to still have events there? Are Atomic Mass going to have events there? Is Peterson angling to maybe take back fancy flight games at some point it, it seems like a strange move but i'm fascinated to see what happens next with it we were saying just before we came on that uh, it's weird because as time wears on it, it it's looking more and more like uh, the tabletop games industry is is behaving more and more like a real grown-up industry <laughs> into the fact that a lot of these uh, these senior figures in the industry are seemingly spending and investing a lot of time trying to run away from being absorbed by the conglomerates. I think it was just a shame that you know, fair enough, they did all the the lots of different games and you know, Letters from Whitechapel and Doom and so many things and then it's just kind of gone okay this works this doesn't work this works it doesn't work and it's just really slimmed down back to arkham star wars like there are more but it's like it's only a small handful now it, it feels like it feels like it's had the soul ripped out of it a little bit doesn't it the company yes i mean maybe it'll all come out with some new games this year and that we'll be surprised but yeah like all, like all the Star Wars stuff, like because the Star Wars card game isn't with them anymore. The Star Wars RPGs are over to Edge. The Star Wars miniature games are over to Atomic Mass. So they basically, got, like in core, in terms of sort of core IPs, they've got Arkham and Descent and Twilight Imperium. Well, still good, right? But yeah, but still good oh, games, no, still well regarded. But yeah, their 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 catalog is massively reduced. Now on to the rest of the news. And speaking of Games Workshop games, Games Workshop has been hit by a few supply issues recently. The Games Workshop, if you're not familiar, they're purveyor of miniatures and games in Nottingham, England, and they have announced that they will have no new pre-orders for a few weeks. Usually Games Workshop are shoving out new releases faster than the blink of an eye, but it would seem that the pandemic supply issues have hit close to home. Although they do some manufacturing in England, a lot of their product is still produced in China, and so shipping issues like the ones in the Suez Canal that we have covered recently are bound to have had an impact. Games Workshop have come under repeated fire for not having enough supply to meet demand, especially of limited edition products like the recently released Warhammer Quest Cursed City. 
you got any thoughts on this, Ben? I know you're a bit more into Games Workshop games than we are. Yeah, I mean, as big as they are, I mean, I think honestly it's more surprising that it's taken until now for them to hit a major supply issue. It's, yeah. it's quite it's quite amazing that they, they've been continuing on a fairly normal release schedule with a with the reduced staff and their plant and all that, I mean, like you say, look, I've I've been to um I've been to their headquarters a couple of times in Nottingham, and the, the bit that you as a visitor are allowed to to be in is actually very small. It's like a huge campus of various buildings where you've got design studios, and they actually do these huge plants where they they do the injection molding for all the miniatures. Mm. It's things like that, the plastic. That they melt down for the injection molding that will come from China. Yeah, and all, all the board game stuff as well. Yeah, they, they don't yeah, have exactly. those facilities. Yeah, all those components, the boxes, things like that. That all comes from China. So as much yeah. as a lot of it is made in the UK, I actually heard there, there was an interesting theory. I think I think Josh actually mentioned it on uh, on one of our recent podcasts. It was. Um, there's a YouTuber whose name escapes me who reckoned that problems specific to Curse City are something to do with Brexit and the box being, you know, saying made in the UK. I think oh, you can only okay. say that yeah. if a certain percentage yeah. of the, the product within the box is made in the UK, whereas like, I think the only thing manufactured in the UK in that box is the miniatures. And mm. I, I, I actually... Actually managed to get a copy. Oh, don't hate me. Are you special? <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. We won't give out addresses or anything, don't we? Miniatures, there's only like uh, three sprues. They take up very little space in that box, and the rest is all just like punch boards and books. Yeah, the, the sort of rules of origin stuff has hit quite a lot of suppliers pretty hard. I know that yeah. much. There's a lot. Like Bre- Brexit has been an interesting one because it's. Like we haven't seen like the big. I think we talked about this in the cast before, but we haven't seen like the mass panic and the big queues and that kind of thing. A lot of the impact is kind of behind the scenes, and it's the small publishers and small suppliers of individual things, like supplying to individual customers in the EU or further afield that yeah. are having real problems because of things like origin problems and all sorts. And yeah. a slight, slight interesting aside before we move on, Games Workshop is now worth more than Marks and Spencers. So, yeah, that's how big the gaming industry in the UK is. Yeah, I, I just hit out with that because I'd heard it somewhere, but Jamie actually went and checked the London Stock Exchange, and it is. Real, real-time research. Anyway, Jamie, talking about financial news. Now, we thought stories about Pokemon cards selling for lots of money was over. Oh, 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 we were wrong. Oh, we were so wrong. Now, a card from 2017 depicting and signed by the president of the Pokemon company has recently sold for $247,230. The card, to give it its full name, 2017 Blackstar hash tpcio one Tsunekatsu Ishihara signed Pokemon GX promo card. Pulls off the tongue. Yeah, that's Jamie. That's Jamie's online persona. I didn't even rehearse that. I was, I was, impre- I was impressed. I impressed myself. Yeah, there. nice. Um, nice. Depict Sunikatsu Ishihara, the current Pokemon Company president, holding a Rotom, which is an electric ghost Pokemon, and throwing a Master Ball. It was created to honor his 60th birthday. Now the card was rated NM7 condition, which is near mint, and the autograph itself was rated nine out of ten. Which I don't really know what that means. Is it nine out of ten authentic? It, it, it didn't dot yeah, the I. Or cross the T. Um, but it's kanji, so that joke is meaningless. Um, it isn't the most expensive yeah. card ever sold, but it's still a hell of a find. Uh, Ishihara himself is, well, I, th- I think he knows his Pokemon. Uh, he founded Creatures, Inc., which was the original studio behind the Pokemon trading card game. He was a producer on the Pokemon Red, Green, Yellow, Gold, and Silver video games, as well as helping develop Pokemon's Snap, Stadium, Pinball, and... Go. Good credits. Yeah, right? Pedigree. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and oh, I guess I said, yeah, remember that in a slightly similar way to NFTs in that, you know, it's, it's a type of asset. Pokemon cards and indeed trading cards are something of a, 
I don't want to say a fad, but it is a, a big asset right now. For example, there is news today of the day we're recording this, which is the 30th of April, of the rapper Post Malone, who has been spending thousands of dollars on Magic the Gathering cards. And you know, this idea that just his presence in, you know, in the Magic the Gathering scene could boost sales because they're like, oh, maybe I could end up playing a game of Post Malone one day. Uh, yeah, yes, he is. He's also a huge Pokemon fan as well. Is he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's move on from uh, Pokemon cards and Magic the Gathering cards and move on to something uh, a bit more a bit more realistic. Ian, vampires in television. Never heard of the two before. Would it work? Well, it, it sounds unlikely, to be frank. I, I can't think of any series that has included vampires in television that has been world famous and incredibly influential in any way or form. Just nonsense, really. But anyway, what we're actually talking about is the World of Darkness role-playing setting, which crashed onto the scene in 1991 with Vampire the Masquerade and has been a mainstay ever since with its myriad of gothic, punk, horror, sci-fi, fantasy role-playing games that spawned off loads of um, spin-offs, werewolf, mage, all sorts of games like that. Well, it's now up for becoming a TV show once more. We'll come back to that in a second. So a franchise of TV shows and films is reportedly now in development with the aid of Eric Heiserer and Christine Bolan. Heiserer is the writer of the 2016 sci-fi film Arrival and the current showrunner on Netflix show Shadow and Bone, which I've yet to get around to watching. And Bolan was writer-producer on the crime series Castle. Castle's great, if incredibly stupid. <laughs> I really like Castle. It's dumb, but it is good fun. Uh, the production company is Hivemind, who are known for The Witcher and The Expanse. And we don't really know what we're going to see from them. This has only really been announced, and it's only been optioned. So it's one of those things within the sort of TV and Hollywood infrastructure where it means that nothing may ever actually come to fruition. But if you want to, uh, a little insight into what something like a Vampire the Masquerade TV series might look like, then you can, and I urge you to not do this, track down Kindred the Embraced, which was a Vampire the Masquerade TV series on Fox that ran for a massive eight episodes between April and May of 1996. So it's the 25th, 25th anniversary of that show. I've watched an episode of that. Do not. It's very, very bad. <laughs> As you may have heard, obviously, we have been joined by the wonderful Ben of Ashen Hold Art and the Unlucky Frog. Ben, first of all, thank you very much for for coming along and, and listening to us prattle on about news and, and offering. Thank you for having me. No, it's 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 great to have you. And it's great to hear someone other than Ian as well uh, and a different opinion because, you know, we because you know we try to have different spheres of interest uh, and Ian has a lot of indie RPGs. But we don't really have a great deal of miniatures knowledge, whereas I know this is your almost very much your wheelhouse. Uh, yeah, it certainly is. I mean, you, I, I don't have my camera on currently on the interview, and this will make for great uh, podcasting. But in my studio, I have cabinets filled with miniatures, and a lot less of them painted than probably should be. But, <laughs> but yeah. But I bet the ones that are painted are well painted. I mean, I like to think so. There you go. I've I've seen I've seen the pictures that you've put up, and they're great. They're great. If you haven't looked at Ashton Hold Art's uh, Facebook page, I highly recommend it because I'm not just saying this because I'm sitting digitally opposite him. But Ben is an excellent painter. Yeah. So what what made you want to sort of um, turn like that that side of the hobby into more of a side hustle? The job, however you want to think about it. Um, it, it was actually um, hand was kind of forced by the pandemic because mm -hmm. it was. I, I'd always maintained that I didn't want to make that work for me. I wanted it to be like a source of catharsis exclusively, and that was it. And you no, know, if if ever like the job opportunities came up or people alerted me to them. I was like, no, 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 I, I don't want to do that. When the, the pandemic hit, my my son had not even turned one yet and my wife had just finished maternity leave. So, And, and if you remember, like right, right when the pandemic started, everything shut down mm -hmm. completely. Yeah. 
even a lot of the people who were later on determined to be like frontliner key workers weren't working for like the first month, month and a half until things settled down and we understood how the virus behaved a bit more. So I wasn't able to go out and work my regular job as an electrician, one, because there wasn't enough uh, work for me and my dad, and two, because someone had to look after my son so that my, my wife could work. Mm. So I, about a month, two months into the pandemic, I started freaking out about money. I thought, hold on a minute. I have a skill. I have a thing that I can do without having to leave my house. So I said to Charlotte, do you think I should do some commission painting? And she's like, yes, I think you should. And the rest, as they say, is history. And it was not as much of a chore as I thought it was going to be either. Yeah. So I, I like, because my my brother in law does does some quite nice painting as well, and he's like kind of looked at it a little bit before like commission painting. He's never really wanted. Are you doing like sort of individual pieces? Are you doing sort of like army commissions, or or, or is it a bit of both? It's a bit of both. It's primarily army commissions at the moment, but I have done uh, I have done a couple of uh, single pieces. But yeah, your your bread and butter is is painting armies. Do I do know that because of that, quite a few com- uh, commission painters do get burned out because mm. they, you know paint painting armies can can be quite hard work because you're painting multiple of quite similar miniatures yeah. for extended periods of time. Uh, so a, a lot of commission painters do aspire to eventually be doing uh, you know what you would call like box art or display miniatures. You're you're just painting a single piece for a collector or for a studio who who needs a picture of their their model for uh, their packaging. Awesome. Um, I'm going to ask a question that is probably it's one of those kind of oh here we go. Do you have out of all the models that you have painted, commissions, personal, whatever? Is there a model that you've gone? This has been my favourite one. Either the process or the or the outcome or a mixture of both. And also, conversely, part two of the question, is there one that you've found to be either the hardest or one you've just gone, this is one I'm not a fan of of doing? Basically, what's your favourite and what's your least favourite miniature to have painted? So for me, my my favourite kit that I've painted so far is the the Games Workshop Fire Slayer Magma Droth kit. I've seen that one. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got got featured in Games Workshop, so artist then, didn't you? Yeah. I did, yeah. Um, I I got featured in the the games workshop. Uh, I won the August twenty eighteen cool community competition. I think with that, that that was quite nice because um, I was I was I was literally standing at the the train station after Tabletop Scotland, and I got a message from Warhammer Community saying that I'd I'd won. Oh so, wow. Nice. Yeah, so straight off tabletop Scotland into that, so I could barely fit my head in the the train that, that <laughs> weekend. You know. But the, I I just love that kit because it combines two things I absolutely love, and that's dragons and dwarves. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I love it so much that I have painted two of them completely, and I'm working on a third one for um some coming painting competitions. And because I'm an absolute lunatic, I've decided to step on all the, the detail Oof. on that. Yeah. Wow. wow. You, can see a, you can see a leg that I've painted of it on my social media. We'll put some links to your social media in the cast notes, certainly, so people can go and have a look at the things that you're doing. I'm looking at the Facebook page now. I'm just kind of scrolling through, and I'm like, oh, yeah, just the different angles of it. <laughs> Jeez, oh. Have, have you yeah. have you found like getting into it, Ben, that there's like quite a lot of competition out there, especially during lockdown? I guess quite a few people have kind of turned to like side hobbies to make money. Yeah, there was definitely a phase where it felt like everyone and their dog was having a go at commission painting, and it completely understandable because so many people were on reduced income. Yeah, and some people just outright lost their jobs as mm-hmm. well. So. It was there were so many people that were in the exact same position as me where they had to find a way to generate money and and logically you do the thing that you have all the gear and equipment for. So 
I I think that I would I would say that the Ashenhold dart for me has been an intersection of good fortune and hard work. Because it, it, it would be false modesty of me to say that I, I got lucky with it. I, I've worked hard at this. Yeah. Um, that I, I've I've been able to get the work because I'm good at it. But I've also been fortunate that the right people have come across my path. And I, I don't think that other people have hit that intersection because it definitely has petered off again. Yeah, thing, well. as as both things start to return to normal and well, I guess move on to other things. Yeah, if it doesn't work out for them, you know. I mean, so you're, uh, are you sort of intending to take this more, like even more professional, like basically do it full time now? Or I I am hoping to. I'm still I'm 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 helping my dad out uh, on site here and there mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm, st I'm still doing a little bit of that I'm still also doing uh, the, the dad at home uh, type role because the play groups and such uh, for my son they've not opened back up so he's still needing full time care and he's he's uh, he's not even two yet so he's still tiny but um, I am taking steps to hopefully do this on a, a more, more full time capacity um, and I, uh, as my my wife goes on to uh, maternity leave at the end of next month, I'll be in a position to take on more work. So if there's anyone listening, <laughs> would like anything commissioned or knows somebody that would like anything commissioned, then uh, uh, please get in touch. I'd be happy to, to talk cool. to you. I'll What's the best like. place for them to get in touch with you, Ben? So I'm on Instagram. Facebook and Twitter, they're all fine. You can also drop me an email at the forge, all one word, at Ashenhold Art, all one word, dot co dot uk. Cool. Um, and any of those avenues are fine. Well, you definitely have. Uh, I, I know somebody who would probably be interested in taking you up on a commission, uh, and that person is me. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. <laughs> I just realised I forgot to tell you the the thing that. Um, did my uh, burst my melon? Oh come on, yeah. Painting. Oh yeah. I talked. I talked about how much I love magma dross. Mm -hmm. I I found plague marines really hard work. Okay. So I I was able to paint them, mm -hmm. and you know, and you you find a way to push yourself and challenge yourself with everything you, that you paint. The thing that I found really difficult with plague marines was how much detail is on even the rank and file guys. Mm. In insane levels of detail, which I think obviously is is why that range is so attractive to a lot of people. But from a painting perspective, you're like, when will this detail end? There's so many <laughs> tentacles. Yeah. <laughs> no, no one wants that many tentacles. No, no. And I assume, obviously, a, a lot of people do. Yeah. A lot of people do. You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. Let's not go down that. Let's not open that door. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think it works fantastic. Yeah, it's a, it's it's come on like le leaves and bands since I first knew you, and it's yeah, you you've done some excellent work over the last for a couple of years. It's really nice stuff. And you got a new logo now as well. From is it Jamie at the Noble Artist? Uh, Jamie Noble Freer from the Noble Artist. Yeah, he he um who also runs Doodle Meeple. If you've heard of that, it's the, the uh, a platform that that recently launched for um board game creatives and. Oh, right. Oh yeah, yeah, and he did a board game a couple of years back, didn't he? Uh, that I'm failing to remember the name of. Hero Master. Hero Master, something like that. Yeah, sort of like slightly tongue in cheek, sort of dungeon adventuring kind of game. If I remember, right. quite goofy, and he, he's he's done things like uh, he calls them geekings cards, right. just like nerdy <laughs> greetings cards. Awesome, which is quite a cool idea. It, but yeah, he's he he's great. Um, and like he when I when I approached him about doing a logo, he understood what I wanted right away. Um, which is always great when you're when you're getting stuff like that done. So go go check out Jamie if you are a nerd, and especially if you're a nerd who likes fantasy, because he's great. Yeah, his, his fantasy art's really good. I'll dig up yeah. all Jamie's links and put those in the show notes as well. No problem. Anyway, uh, we should move on from talking about miniatures, uh, the fascinating conversation as it is. Uh, we should wrap this thing up. Uh, we'd very much like to thank all our patrons for continuing to support the cast through the last very weird years, as we've said, especially our executive producer, Sean Newman, 
from the Game Lot team. We'll put link to all Sean's things in the show notes. And you can find multiple ways to support us on the site. Just go to the support us part of the page. Jamie, take us home with news of Cluedo. It, it's Monopoly news, Jamie. That's what I want from you. Monopoly news, not Cluedo news. I know they're similar, like similar era. See, see you've got to listen to what I'm saying, Ian. That's gonna that joke's gonna make sense in a sec. From the OP USAopoly. Persistent purveyors of pop culture board game products comes Dragon Ball Z Cluedo. Oh yes, you knew. You know, you were wondering. I heard you. They heard you, fans, crying out for for Cluedo. Going, when am I going to get to play as Goku? Well, now you can play as Goku, Piccolo, Gohan, Vegeta, Prince of Saiyans, Krillin, or Gotenks, the fusion of Gohan and Trunks, son of Vegeta, uh, and work out which villain out of Bojack, Broly. Kid Buu, Cell, Frieza, or Garlic Jr., which of them is going to find a Dragon Ball? Which of your heroes is going to stop them? And where is that mighty fight going to take place? Is it going to be in an iconic place such as the Hyperbolic Time Chamber? Or is it another iconic place like... The Wilderness? I mean, I wasn't on board until he says Hyperbolic Time Chamber, and then I was like, I'm in. I'm, I'm still not on board. I mean, like you, you did a great job there selling that, <laughs> Jamie, but yeah. Thank you, yeah. I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sold myself, but uh, you know what? Someone out there will enjoy it, and if that's you and you listen to this, you know what it is now. Thank you so much for listening. If you like what you've listened to, then the best way to help us out is to share the podcast and drop us a review and rain on iTunes. You can also follow us on all the usual social media, and do come and join us on our Discord for our regular games nights and to chat to the community there. We'll also put links to all of Ben's Ashenhold art content and the Lucky Frog in the show notes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.